Good evening and uh, welcome to this evening's session with uh, the BCS Learning Development Specialist Group. Uh, tonight's session is Through the Looking Glass, Technology and Visual Impairment. Uh, my name is Kevin Streeter, I'm the Chair of the BCS Learning Development Specialist Group and uh, uh, welcome to the session tonight. I'm just going to do a brief introduction while we have other people join us and uh, then I'll hand over to Dawn who's giving us our talk this evening. So, uh, jumped ahead a bit here. Yeah. Uh, so, BCS Learning Development Specialist Group. Uh, it's a group for those that are involved in the development, delivery or management of learning to IT and communication professionals and users. So hopefully in that description, um, that will resonate with you as, as something that uh, you're interested in. And uh, hopefully you'll see tonight's session will be very much in support of this. The membership of the, the specialist group, uh, we have about 18% coming from the end user uh, skills training world. We have about 18% coming from IT professional skills. So that's things like project management, service management, and so on. Uh, about 16% from the IT technical skills training world. So product training, hands-on technical type training. 16% from educational university, and just a third who have just a general interest in IT skills topics. Uh, we do have a uh, specialist group website uh, on the BCS uh, uh, website. Um, if you go to uh, this page, you'll see all the latest information about events that we've got coming up. Um, and you'll also be able to get access to some of the past events uh, that we've been running. But if you want to find out more about the group, then please go to this page. And if you want to watch any of our past uh, webinars, then uh, please go to the BCS Member Groups YouTube channel and uh, all of our events for the last two years are up there, um, uh, up to last month's and uh, they usually go up there within a week or so uh, of each event. So uh, if you want to play tonight's event again or look at any of our past events, then please go to the, the Member Groups YouTube channel. We also were involved in the creation of a book for technical training management. Um, just a quick note to say, the book is available from the BCS Bookshop. Um, if you're interested in any form of management uh, of uh, training content, whether it's creating content, delivering content, then uh, that's, that will be a really useful book for you. And our future events. So, um, oh, it's an earlier version of the slides. Um, so, June, we have um, uh, the importance of demonstrating a learning culture for organizational survive, survival. Um, so, looking forward to that event. Um, please go and register for it if that's of interest to you. And uh, uh, see you in June. July, we're going to have an event around early careers. Um, BCS has set up an early careers executive to help people who are coming in to the industry at the beginning of their careers, whether that's people transitioning into IT or people that have come out of school or university. Um, so we're going to have a, a session uh, in July specifically around early careers. And in September, uh, we're going to have a look at degree accreditation. Um, the BCS degree accreditation program is being updated, and uh, there's been a lot of other work going on around uh, the Institute of Coding and looking at just what is degree accreditation all about. So uh, September, we'll be doing an event on that. If you have any other ideas, please send me an email and uh, I'll feed it through to the committee and uh, 
look forward to uh, getting your ideas on the schedule. So with that, oh no, one, I always forget this slide. Um, social media, please follow us on Twitter. Um, we have 500 plus followers and uh, you'll see Michelle tweeting as we go through the, this evening. And uh, please follow us, the, the handle's there and uh, that will give you the, the fastest way to find out about new events that the, the group's running. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dawn, who is a member of our committee. And uh, Dawn's uh, interesting topic about uh, visual impairment and, and technology and what it's like. And Dawn, can we transition to your slides? Yes, you should be able to, um, just bear with me. Let's see if this works. Uh, it was it was there a second ago. It disappeared again. There we go. Right. So, so if you just Dawn, I'm going to hand over to you. And uh, they, oh, we lost your lost your slides again. There we go. Okay, are you ready to start, Dawn? Yes, I'm ready to start. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So my presentation tonight is uh, through the looking glass. Can you see the issues um, and visual, visual impairment? And it isn't just about um, visual impairment itself. There's a little bit in there about general eye care. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So I'm going to. I'm, at the moment, I'm welcoming you. I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my Sorry role. Sorry and... interrupt. Sorry? Dawn, your slides have gone. We're oh, not gosh. seeing your slides anymore. Oh, gosh. Just bear with me. That's all right. Can you see them now? Yes, you're good. Brilliant. OK. So, yeah, the, my role in an overview, overview of how sight loss has impacted me. Um, some useful assistive technology that I'm either aspiring to use or have been using, um, some useful useful applications, and then um, eye care. And then if you want to ask some questions at the end, if you direct them to, um, to Kevin, he will pass them on to me and I'll answer them at the end. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to move on to my first slide. So this is a little bit about me. I was an ITT trainer for 20 plus years. I've worked in mainly in um, education, uh, primary, secondary, further education and higher education. And um, before retiring, I did I did contribute significantly to the computer science secondary um, workforce in the UK. Um, I've also been involved in quite a number of um, grassroots organisations, so um, computer science networks, um, computing at school, uh, Python Software Foundation, I've done quite a bit of work with them, um, Raspberry Pi Foundation, and then I was part of a group of people that set up a foundation for digital creativity. My personal interest is safeguarding and particularly adolescent online behaviours. And since 2018, I have been severely sight impaired. OK, and, and that for me has been quite an interesting and sometimes devastating journey. But um, I've learned to adapt to my new circumstances. So this was my work. This is what I had to do, the primarily for my role. Um, I had to supervise people on teaching practice, which involved looking at the portfolio of evidence that they gathered towards um, meeting the teaching standards, um, looking at how they've applied that evidence and reviewing their reflections on the work that they delivered. And then there was an academic aspect which involved um, checking the audits that they've created to evidence um, their skill sets and 
evidence of where they acquired those skills and how those skills have been applied in the classroom. So that was, so you can see there's a lot of eye work there, an awful lot of things that I had to do that involved my eyes and, and I found it incredibly difficult. So one of the things that people don't realize is that visual impairment is not just, it's not just somebody who can't see anything at all. Um, it's a spectrum of conditions which impact on the ability for a person to be able to see. And there's some people with moderate sight loss, but nevertheless impactful to 4% of people who see absolutely nothing at all, black, blackness. Um, I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later on in the presentation. But one of the things that I want you to take away from this is that not all blind people can see absolutely nothing at all, okay. So sorry about this, moving swiftly on. So I've talked about this spectrum, that there is kind of a legal continuum and we've got people who are temporary impacted, temporarily in, impacted by sight loss. Um, and that tends to be things like eye infections or people who don't wear safety glasses when they're performing DIY tasks or other things in the home where they get things in their eyes. And, and that leads to temporary sight loss that's corrected, usually when the eye he, heals. Um, and then we move on from that to being sight impaired. Now, sight impaired is a certified category. You can be certified sight impaired. And the usual process for that is you are seen by, um, by, the, by the local eye clinic in the hospital and they deem you at, to be sight impaired. They test your eyes and they look at other things as well. And then you're issued with a certificate of sight impairment. Um, and then you move on to being severely sight impaired. So that's re the legal, term for being blind so it and, and that's kind of like a the end phase if you would of, of the sight impairment journey um the sight impairment certificate is signed by um somebody who, one of the consultants that works at the eye clinic and they have a person called an ECLO who's an eye clinic liaison officer that notifies people like social services and other other people that might be able to assist you um, once you've become registered blind now this when i reached this part it was it was quite a significant um I wouldn't say milestone, it's not the right word, but an event in, in my um, career. Um, I had to rethink about how I did everything connected with my job. And that involves the use of technology. OK, so we've talked about this. I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but this is going over what I've just talked about. The temporary sight loss, the sight impairedness and the severely sight impairedness. So I'm going to just move on very quickly onto the next slide which talks about the definition we've talked about um, quite a lot of people have temporary sight loss and um, if you think about the summer months when uh, you get hay fever or um, you have a period of time where your glasses are broken and you can't see a lot of people suffer with temporary sight loss and if you have somebody in your learning cohort that um, that's experiencing this, you've just got to make sure that materials are available which can be adjusted. So things like making the print maybe a little bit bigger or if there is a facility to provide them with equipment that can magnify um, the, 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 uh, any region that's necessary for participating, then that's, that's really, really helpful. But it's only ever a temporary thing. It's just for the duration of whatever their um, condition is that's causing the temporary sight loss. So temporary sight loss support, the kind of things that you can um, do is you can use magnification um, software. You can use things that make the text bigger. Um, I've put the finger uh, icon on there because it's the way that most people make their screens bigger, they splay their fingers so that it makes what's on, what's on their screen uh, appear bigger. You can actually buy magnifiers, um, which which are range from little small credit card sized um, things to really industrial sized things that just make things look a little bit bigger. Um, things like making sure that your instructions that you give are very, very clear. Um, I'll, and I'll come back to that again as, as as we progress through the presentation. Mobile phones are just 
an absolute um well for me it's an absolute must i could not survive without my mobile phone and sometimes with temporary sight loss you can make use of sunglasses to protect the eye and also to keep the light out to stop the uh, eye from being further impacted by by uh, light so sight impaired generally a sight impaired person has some field of vision but which means they can actually see quite a, quite a few things but their sight is restricted it could be something like macular degeneration which comes with age um, it could be um, that they've got scarring on their eye that restricts what they can actually see out the the eye um, but generally this this type of sight needs some intervention to to support the person who um who, who's experiencing this and there are things that you can do to to help um to help people in this this situation so quite a lot of people in this circumstance who are who are registered as sight impaired they will have their own equipment that they've purchased that helps them to be able to um access materials or or presentations um but things like if you're running an event for somebody who's sight and you know the sight impaired if you have a steward at the event you know so that they can direct people and take them to the seats and when i say that I'm, i don't just mean because i've had some really interesting experiences with um certain rail companies where i've needed to change platforms and there's been somebody there that's a steward and they've um i've, I've said i need to go from here to there and it's over there you know over the bridge over there and i'm thinking i can't see the bridge and i don't know where over there is so you must make sure that the people who are the stewards at the events can actually physically take the person to the pot to where they are going so that's you know the, the first and probably most useful tool that you will ever have at an event is an informed person who can actually um interpret instructions and make sure that that they're carried out safely and then finally making larger print available um generally sight impaired people will know the size of text that they um they can access that they can see um, because that's determined at the at the clinic when they have their eyes tested so so that's that's that one so moving on um i've talked about support yeah they will have the same kind of support as as a, a person with just temporary sight impairment so all the things that you would use for them um, but you might have things like speech to text software and they can carry something that's called a symbol cane um, again i'm going to come back to symbol canes because um, they don't help to navigate it's just a cane that they carry on their person that's quite small um, it's probably like a, you know if you know what a majorette is in a in a drum band where they twirl the stick it's probably a bit smaller than that but it's white and um, most sight impaired people will have one of those again we've talked about the glasses and what they do um, but somebody who's sight impaired may not wear glasses they may not um, have have dark glasses or anything like that they just might they just might look perfectly um unimpacted by by their sight loss but they d nevertheless they do have that um severe sight impairment which is what i have is a very it's an extremely limited field of vision okay very limited um i i was born blind in one eye um I, I, he used to see children at school with patches over one eye to try and encourage the optic nerve to work so i was born with that and then i had my other eye that was perfectly normal and um and compensated for the eye that didn't see but somebody who's severely sight impaired has a very limited um field of vision and and i do require support and intervention so if i'm going um, out anywhere generally i have a sighted guide with me it's taken me quite a while to get um, cane training because of the COVID um, crisis. Um, and something else to consider as well is that uh, blind people can't socially distance off a lot of them because they can't see distance. They don't know how, where they are in proximity to the person who is next to them or where noise is coming from. 
and anything that's re that, that's sort of text based is really difficult to process because um, and you'll see why a little bit in a minute when I show you how I actually see things. So some of the things that I use, I use uh, speech to text and text to speech and um, things that really help. Um, I use I use some software called Otter AI, which allows me to write letters and dictate things. Um, and if you um, if if you know that a person is coming to your event um, and they haven't got a dictaphone or something like that, they might want to record. They can they can actually download you know Otter AI to their device. But there's also electronic readers and software. And I'm going to come back to equipment. In a minute, but they will always require when they when they've re when they've received this diagnosis or reached this level of sight impairment, they will always need support with with their um, moving around and such like. So, severe sight impairment. Now, one of the things that I wanted to highlight here is there's there's the stereotype really of, of of blind people a lot of people think that if you are blind you've got a guide dog you've got a cane you know you wear dark glasses not everybody who is sight impaired fits that stereotype okay um some blind people have a guide dog i can't have a guide dog because i have a shoulder impingement which means that i can't control a dog um, using using my arm because of the injuries that I've had to my shoulder. So I don't have a guide dog. I do wear ga dark glasses when I'm outside because the sun impacts my eyes. But I do have sometimes like now I'm just wearing ordinary um, glasses, which help, which do help a little bit with being able to see things. Um, and I have several different types of um, cane to, to help to navigate talked about the you know bigger size fonts um but there are some I, I find a lot of fonts very very difficult to read my personal font size is round about size 24 so what's on the slide in front of me there's i can see some of the pictures but i can't see the title so i hope it's spelled correctly and i have run it through a spell checker to see a severely sighted person will make use of peer support so they'll have um, they'll have a person who is their guide or carer or somebody who takes care of them getting around from A to B. They make extensive use of software and um, you'd be quite surprised at how much software does impact on mobile phone software in particular. Um, I once got lost and I, I couldn't I couldn't see where I was. It's quite a frightening experience, actually, when you're not used to that. And um, my mobile phone was was my lifesaver. You know, I, I literally talked to it, asked, asked somebody to, you know, asked the phone to find my husband and call him um, using Siri. And um, he looked up on a piece of software that we use um, to find out where I am at any given time. And he's not tracking or stalking me. It's just to make sure that I'm safe. Um, and from that software, I was directed home. Now, during the pandemic, which we've had, you know, blind people have been significantly impacted by the pandemic because it's not always easy to access the internet, but we do make good use of um, Teams software for meetings, that there is an accessible element to Teams software that we can use. Um, we do have, um, sites that we use we have our own facebook groups and things like that that we use that are both regional and national um to, to communicate so i'm a member of a blind astronomy group and i use um you'd be surprised about that but i have a a, um, a 3d printed grid where i can feel where the planets are that that, that the sighted people are looking at and i'm looking at in the future using 3D printers to make printed grids for particular um, particular times in the sky, you know, for, to see different things in the sky. Um, peer support is incredibly important for um, blind people because it is it is quite um, a scary thing to, to actually lose lose your eyesight. And I'll talk to again, I'll talk to you a little bit more like that, about, about things like that in, in a little minute. But um, when I when I first sort of when I first received my diagnosis, 
I was in kind of like denial for a long time and I needed to speak to people who were like me. There's nobody in my family that's sight impaired. Um, I'm the only I'm the only person in my family. And so it was really difficult for um, them to understand how things impacted me. Um, and also it was very difficult for me to understand why they couldn't see that I was finding things difficult. So the, some things are quite funny, um, you know, as, as blind people, we get together and laugh about some of the things that are happening. Um, but my husband, and he's not, a, he's not a mean man, I don't want you to think he's a mean man, but we'll be going on a walk together and he would be my guide. And then the family had also come. And then all of a sudden, I wasn't there and they were all walking on ahead because I'd fallen over a tree stump, you know, and, and I was kind of laid on the floor. And and like for me, then the walk was over. I was quite upset about it. But um, when you talk to other blind people and you have this peer support group, it helps you to um, understand that you're not the only person in the world. So technology and um, the co-op uh, supports uh, peer um peer get togethers for blind people. They have conference calls um, that where you have a sighted person that dials everybody in and we get together and we talk and that happens usually about two or three times a week. So that's really, really helpful. OK, so moving on from this, this is how I have been um, impacted by it. So general mobility and navigation, um, things like going somewhere new, that, that's that's quite a big thing. If I'm going some, somewhere that I know I haven't been before, that can be really, really difficult for me because I've no um, mental map of, of how that space looks. And so that can be really quite difficult. Um, I can remember going to, we had an event at Canary Wharf one time and I was incredibly late because I was too frightened to ask somebody that I didn't know where, you know, I didn't know where I was going. And I got lost a few times going around London as well. Navigating around the workplace is particularly difficult. Um, and the reason for that is we work in ergonomic environments where we have chairs that move and, um, you know, we, we carry equipment around with us. Um, our desk spaces are sorted so that we can work in them. And, you know, it, most of us, push back on our chair to get up and don't think to push it back underneath a table. So a blind person operating in, in a workspace, particularly a, a, an IT room, um, is finds it very, very difficult because the chair legs stick out further than the actual seat space. So you can find the seat space, you know, your stick will find that, but they won't find the arms that are at the bottom um, of, of the chair. And, and so that can be problematic. Um, Travelling to and from work is is another area that's problematic. Um, you can listen to directives that are given in train stations and things like that. But the main thing is you are not allowed to drive a car as a blind person for obvious reasons. Um, so when you when they take your driving license off you, that's quite um, quite a big um, and life changing moment. And it was for me um, to rely on British Rail and other um, other transport services was was very difficult initially. Um, now I won't use them unless I've got somebody with me. But at the beginning, I, I was quite brave and I tried to do things by myself. And I'm hoping to get back to that um, that point, but I'm not quite there yet. Supportive technologies. Um, I have um, a tablet, a large tablet that I use. I have a laptop. I've got a screen that's quite a lot bigger than. Um, most people would have and you know so I use an awful lot of, of supportive technologies and I'll come back to those again. Um, performing work related tasks, things that you used to do before you um, lost your sight are more difficult so one of the things that I found very difficult when I was working was maintaining records of my um, trainees so Often when you populate um, databases, the, the space that fields take up on the screen mean that certain input, um, input boxes are not where you expect them to be. 
and so that that impacts on all sorts of things and the colors and things that that people um use one of the pieces of software that i used was um a light blue background with dark blue text and i couldn't differentiate between the two very easily so so that's something that that um that's really difficult and then the final thing really well there's two really there's the social isolation isolation that you feel because when when I used to teach um, in a classroom, I could look round and see who was falling asleep and change the activity a little bit to re-engage people and things like that. And you can't see that. So you just constantly, a, a bit like I'm now, can't see any faces as I'm delivering this. You you can't pick up on visual cues. And so that that is very, very isolating. And the end result of that is managing your emotions, your personal confidence and how you feel about yourself generally um, and that is for me were the most significant impacts that I had as as an indiv as, as, as a personal individual and i having spoken to a lot of people with sight loss now um, as I've come to know them I, I recognize these are pretty pretty much the same um, in, in all people who have suddenly lost their sight loss. Um, and this isn't um, this isn't meant to be offensive, but people who are born with sight loss and have not known any different manage things much, much far better really than 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 someone who's just experienced sight loss. So uh, so for obvious reasons they 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 don't know any different and also they have um they, they have their own support mechanisms that mechanisms that they've used from being very young so so that's that so when you lose your sight in the work environment and i'm not going to go on too much about this but you have um hr um and they have something called occupational health and the occupational health people work in conjunction with the RNIB, the Royal National Institute for Blind People. And there is a, um, a, a part of the government that's designed to help disabled people stay in work and they're called Access to Work. And all those three people work together to create a, a, a framework that helps a visually impaired person stay in work. And there's all sorts of things that can happen. Um, so if you work in a large organization, it might be that you can change jobs or move to do something different to what you did or allocate various aspects of your work to other people so that so that you can focus on the tasks that you can do. So so that's how it how it's you know how how you access the help and support that you need. Okay. So 96% of the um, information that you receive about your environment is processed through your eye, through you know everything that you look at, it gives your brain information and you know your cornea manages the amount of light that comes in and out of your eye and the lens moves so that you can um, adjust your focus and what you can see so it's it's quite um, an important an important part of your body and when you lose your sight obviously that environmental information is not as clear as it should be and so therefore that's why sight loss is, is considered a disability so my sight loss condition is a, is a condition called ulcerative keratitis and this um this condition is is something that is on more or less every work surface that there is all over the world um, but when you've it's when i think 95 percent of the um population are exposed to it and people with compromised immune systems like me um eventually become impacted by it um, there's no cure for it yet and and it um it just doesn't respond very well at all to stress and the the gray circles that you can see on there are meant to represent some of the ulcers that i had on my eyes um, and i use i take antiviral meds every day and i use eye drops a few times a day as well um, to control 
the um, ulceration of my eye. Um, what you can't see there as well is as, as well as the ulcers, there are things called dendrites, which are like little long tails that come across your eye. And when someone shines a light in, in your eye, it's like a smashed mirror and, and the light's refracted all around your eye. So you can't um, easily see um, what's going on around you. OK, so this is how I would see um, a picture. I'm going to show you the picture in a minute. But my brain, when I'm looking at something, is constantly trying to fill in the gaps and it is quite tiring. Um, so so you'll you'll have a picture and there's bits of it missing. And that's why reading is difficult, because you you can only see part of what you're supposed to see. Um, so the rest of it, you've you fill in the gaps basically so a little experiment that you did at perhaps at school if you can put your two fingers up in front of your face um, and then move one of the fingers out to the left it disappears from your view but you can still see because your brain makes up that um makes up that picture um, based on the environmental information it holds. And so my brain is constantly trying to see what's behind these blanks that I have in my vision. And, and it is like I say, I've got five of these circles on my eye that I can't see, but I just didn't want to have a, a messy looking picture because you can get the gist of what I can see. And this is what you would see from that picture you've got lovely flower and a lovely background and all nice colors and what have you the bit of a difference there isn't there from from what you can see to what i can see so how do people use assistive technology so i'm going to show you some of the assistive technology that i have used as part of my um, journey towards um, navigating my sight loss world now so the first thing I have um, is this. Um, most of you will um, like a hot drink when you're going to work in the morning and people with sight loss are no different. And I like to be independent. I like to do as much as I can for myself. Um, and when you're messing about with boilers and things like that, we have a geezer at work. Um, quite a few times I've burnt myself on that. So um, I found this little device. Um, it's it's got three different sensors on it and one of the prongs is for the water level the other one's for milk and the other one tells you when you're near to the top of the cup to stop filling so that you don't overflow and it's a tiny gadget it's very small um, but it, it's it's an absolute miracle because you can actually use it to make yourself a hot drink um, without burning yourself so so that's quite good and uh, I carry one of these around with me most of the time because I like to have a go at making myself a hot drink when I can okay this is a, a device called a ruby and a ruby is like a small um, tablet but it's it's got really strong magnification software on it so you can use it for all kinds of things you can look at you can take it to the shops with you and look for the detail in the ingredients of something um, that you're going to buy or you can look at um, you can look at QR codes as well and it will it will give you information on QR codes but it also allows you to change the color of the background so you can change the background color. I, I struggle with white um, because obviously white bounces light back into your eye. So if I have a black background with white text on it or yellow text on it, that's easier for me to see. Um, but other people have this blue and yellow and there's all different colors, but you can change the what you can see on the screen to accommodate your own sight loss. And if you look at the side, you've got some you've got some buttons there. They've got a texture to them. I wish we were doing a show and tell almost so that you could see um, these things. I've got two of these Ruby devices and you can actually move your fingers up and down it. And it shows it, you've got um, little um, notches on there that tell you which button you are you're dealing with. And, and it's it's um, it's a lot like an iPad. You have to charge it up and you can look at um, various things, you know, to labels to whatever, you know, whatever it is that you want to look at. But I find that incredibly useful. OK, my, my iPad, I have um, I have 
the the biggest iPad that you can have, the the iPad Pro, and and it's it's the big version of it. To so give me something that I had, it's called real estate. Your screen, what you can actually see on your screen, and um, I have a number of applications that I'm going to go into, but the main important one of this is the tracking service that I use and the QR code reader and the speech recognition software because I can virtually get that iPad to do more or less what I want it to do. Um, it doesn't wash the dishes though, unfortunately, and it doesn't um, doesn't run the hoover around the living room, but it does help me to be able to cope in a in a workplace or in a in an environment because um, I can use all these facilities that are more or less inbuilt into the iPad that help me. But also there are other, it isn't just an iPad, you, there are other tablet technologies that have the same facilities inbuilt. But it just helps me to be able to, um, first of all, I, w I went to a BCS meeting in London um, about two years ago, I think it was now, and I got there and back just using my iPad. Um, nothing else. I didn't have a sighted guide. I didn't have a stick. I had a, a set of headphones and an iPad and I could get to where I was going in London without needing any help. Um, when I got home, I was quite exhausted, but I did it. So so that was that was that. This is something that's on my wish list at the moment. I'm hoping to get one of these. This is a, um, a, a white cane that has GPS um, built into it. It also has obstacle detection. Now, it's quite interesting is obstacle detection because when you're using an ordinary cane, just a white manual cane, you only find things that are going to be at your feet. And honestly, white canes are like, well, mine was like a miracle when I first learned to use it because you actually have to be trained to use a cane. You can't just go and buy a cane and start you know walking around with it it's actually I think it's an offense I'm not sure somebody once told me it was an offense but I'd have to check up on that um, but you can only see things that are kind of waist height and, and below really or even like just as low as your knee and your foot because you move the cane and obviously it gives you two steps warning of what's coming up in front of you and and to be able to work, use a cane independently. Um, my first thing I did was I posted a postcard to my grandchildren. And that was that was just amazing to be able to do that by myself. But what's wonderful about this cane is that it doesn't just detect what's at your feet. It detects what's overhead as well. And the amount of time I've walked into hedges or signs or things, you know, I'm, I'm forever banging into stuff. Um, and I want one of these because I think it will it will help me to not um, not not foot walk into things so much, um, and it vibrates. And it's also you can set it to um, to give you instructions about where you want to go and things like that. In the same way that you would with your sat nav um, in in you know in your car or on you know on your phone. So that's on my wish list. I'm going to get myself one of those. Um, this is something called a Sumi band, and it's a little bit like an electronic tag, um, but that again has um, it has a tracker device on it. Um, it also can feel what's um, what's overhead, or if you've got obstacles. One of the things that people are doing more of these days is putting sandwich boards outside shops and for blind people they are an absolute nightmare you know I've, I've fallen over a number of these um, and you you feel really bad for the shop owner as well because obviously they're just trying to attract business but for you it's it's a bit of a nightmare um, bollards as well um, bollards on roads and things like that where on pavements when you're trying to cross the road they can be um problematic and you know so you, any obstacle that you've got or an overhead obstacle can be detected using this uh, using this piece of kit but the other thing as well that this thing does which is really quite incredible is it tells you when you're too close to people and obviously we're all in the middle of this well we're just coming out of this pandemic hopefully um and one of the big, huge issues for um, blind people is I'm, I'm not able to tell how far away a person is from me. And so and I can't see on the floor where the markers are for where you're supposed to stand. So consequently, I've gone into shops 
with with my uh, other half and he's he'll be saying what are you doing you know and I'm I'm stood really close to somebody that I can't you know I can't detect that they're there um so so that that sumi band does help with that because it does it it does sort of look at what's in your proximity as well and give you feedback on that these are the mobile phone applications that I make extensive use of um so I'm not too bad in terms of detecting colour. You've seen from my um, visual, um, my visual sort of picture that I gave you before. I can see colours, so I know if my top matches my bottom and things like that. You know, or if um, you know if I, I tend to do, I tend to put things on the wrong way round a lot, or inside out. But but I can see what colours I've got, and and so that's that's quite good. But Seeing AI is a Microsoft product and it, it you can just point at something, it'll tell you what it is um, and it'll give you, you know, a background description as well of what of, of what it is. And I've got this on my phone. It's fantastic. Um, be my eyes. OK, so when I went to London, um, I got lost, as you, as you would, and uh, I didn't know where I where I was. And so I used this um, application and it connected me to somebody who could look on my tracker, uh, my, my tracker on my iPad and tell me where I needed to go to get to the, you know, the, where I needed to be. And then I've I've not really used Third Eye because I tend to use seeing AI. But Third Eye um, is, is like another application that goes on your phone and it talks to you and tells you about, you know, everyday objects like which is the tea, which is the coffee. Um, one of the ladies that I speak to once uh, um, a few weeks ago, she made a corned beef potato hash and used um, coffee instead of gravy browning. So she had an interesting dinner that night. Um, and I've I've had a few instances like that where I've put things into things that are not supposed to um, be there. I haven't quite put salt in coffee or anything like that yet, but um, if it wasn't in the right cupboard, I probably would do something like that. But third eye really helps with that. Okay, um, moving swiftly on. This this Otter AI has been an absolute godsend for me. Um, I like to go to conferences and I like to know, I like to keep records of what people are saying. And so this is on my phone and, and I, um, I never record without asking people first, but I do record events that I go to so that I can... Um, I can play it back and it will convert it to you know, the, the speech to text. Um, you sometimes do have to go over it and um, play it again and play it again so that you've got exactly the gist of things. But I use that for my research when I'm interviewing people or um, lots and lots of different things. Sometimes if I'm if I have a thought whilst I'm whilst I'm being driven somewhere, I um I talk into my phone and, and that keeps kind of like a record. Um, Dragon, naturally speaking, that, that product enables me to open up um, different types of software on, on my um, screen. I would have liked to have given you a demonstration of that actually, but um, it's it's a bit difficult in this, um, in this environment at the moment. So Dragon um, also allows you to, to um, dictate as well um, it will you can open up word with it you can punctuate documents you can include pictures and things in it and you can also save your files um, and it also um, it enables you to close your computer down totally you know without ever touching a button you know without ever touching anything you could just literally um, sit at your desk with your computer and then it'll It'll do everything from there. Now, one of the things about about Dragon is you have to train it first to your voice. So you've, you'll have seen train your dragon. You know, literally, you have to train your dragon in order to get it to work properly. But when it does work, it's amazing. Um, 
there's there's also for people who can't see at all you know the this four percent of people that just can't see at all um, th there's this jaws i've not used jaws but i believe that it is it's incredible for those people who can't see at all and it has all the software of above um, but it also enables people to navigate um, around a computer without using a mouse so that's uh, that's jaws um, some of the things that I use, I, I, I used to like reading. I was a bit of an avid reader before, and um, once once my sight went, I I couldn't really do that. So now I use RNIB Bookshare, which is quite a large library. It's it's got audio books in there, and it's not just for um, people with sight loss. If you have um, dyslexia or um, anything that prevents you from reading materials I think I don't know if it's size 14 font or below I'm not sure but if, if you um, if you have difficulty with reading materials you can you can access this through most university libraries if you're affiliated to a university or you can apply directly for a subscription to RNIB Bookshare and the service is free of charge but they do RNIB do a lot of fundraising to um to support this you know this facility and like I say I, I get quite a few books and I listen to them and you know I, I, I make really good use of the RNIB, RNIB bookshare um audible obviously we all use audible as sighted people you know if we've got our train journeys or whatever we 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 go on we like to all listen to a book and it's no different for blind people um i make extensive use of audible i've got um i've got headphones next to my bed and i usually tend to listen to them at night time and then we've got talking newspapers and magazines who are always looking for volunteers um, so if you're struggling to, you know, if, if you've got a lot of free time, which I don't think any of us have, but if you do, um, talking newspapers and magazines are are brilliant. And I have to say that in the um, in in the northwest of the country, particularly, and also going over into Yorkshire as well, there's there's quite a lot of talking newspapers and magazines that are really really helpful to um, to you know to to be able to access as a blind person. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to share with you tonight is that, you know, my, my sight loss could have been prevented and the majority of sight loss for people of my age is preventable. Okay, um, and, and what it's about is, is about recognizing the signs and looking for, um, how you know how you would um how you would improve you know your 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 eye care um so for me i was a busy lecturer had a number of students i was zipping around here there and everywhere very very time poor and also working with keyboards all the time i was constantly you know getting itchy eyes and touching my face and you know and, and all this sort of stuff and when when I used to get when I used to get eye conditions, I used to get um, you know runny eyes and sore eyes and all this sort of stuff. I'd just go and buy an over the counter um, medicine, and I'm hoping that people who are listening to this tonight that you will decide that you're not going to do that anymore. That if your eyes are itchy, sore, and you know you know that things that your vision becomes distorted please go and get it sorted so i'm going to show you something in a minute just bear with me so we all get these itchy eyes don't we you know when we're working with computers every day you know particularly if you wear contact lenses as well uh, my condition is is affiliated with people who use contact lenses and you know, like I say, I'd go and buy thing, all sorts of different eye products. I'm not going to name them, but lots and lots of just over the counter things. And you would recognize that as perhaps being your eyes some of the time when you've been working at a screen all day. Um, however, this is how my eye became. The whites of my eyes went particularly red. And if you can see on the blue eye on the left hand side, so we've, that has we've lost. Sorry, Dawn, we've lost your slides. Yes. 
Oh gosh, how's that happened? It, they've just gone. Is That's that, it. They're gone. Thank they're you. back. Yeah. Okay. They're so, back. so this is right. Did you see the previous one then? I can't. I don't think I can get back to it. Just bear with me. So these are the, the itchy eyes that probably most of you are used to. Okay. Yeah. Moving on from that, this is this is how my eye went. I ended up with ulcers on my eye. It doesn't look very pleasant. It, in fact, it isn't very pleasant at all. And it's very difficult to actually see this without a use of a blue a blue light. But had I have gone to the um, to the hospital or to the A and E unit where my eyes look like this they probably wouldn't have ended up looking like that. So so that's something that's, you know, that's worth, um, you know, worth thinking about. So how can you prevent it? Well, everybody at the moment who's here tonight, you will all use a keyboard as uh, as part of your role. You know, we, we can't avoid them, can we? And so if you do use a keyboard, you know, make sure that you wash your hands, you know, COVID, one of the good, if there are any good things about COVID, one of the good things is that the improvement of personal hygiene has, you know, sort of gone through the roof, hasn't it? It's kind of, um, you know, everybody's got sanitizer all over the place and, you know, we're all washing our hands to the nth degree. And so that will will minimise the, the risk of picking things up from keyboards. But if you do use the keyboard, you know, make sure that your equipment is is clean. I used to use um, a, a, an antiseptic spray on my keyboards in the classroom um, when I worked in schools. I didn't do it with adults so much, really, because you tend to think that, you know, they're going to wash their hands and things like that. But one of the things I would say to you is that if you do have a Bluetooth um, your own keyboard and mouse that you can carry around with you, that will minimise um, your risk of contracting this um, this this virus. And also, if you can, and this is really difficult, but if you can avoid using multi usage workstations, I mean, once once the virus is um, under control a bit better, I think that uh, we will probably go back to that way of working where you've hot desk in and things like that. So, you know, where possible, try to avoid those those things. Um, if you can, make sure that you get your eyes checked regularly, um, particularly mainly if you work, wear contact lenses, but if you're prone to itchy sore eyes and you're working with a screen, make sure you go, you know, frequently to, to get your eyes tested. However, it tends to change with the NHS. I don't know if it's two years now or every year, but make sure that you get your eyes tested regularly. And finally, these are some of the organisations and some of the apps that have helped me. OK, so I when I first lost my sight, the RNIB provided me with counselling. They provided me with um, support. They put me in touch with peer groups of people um, and I have um, like a mentor, an RNIB mentor that supports me. Guide dogs. A lot of people think that that the RNIB, I've, I put guide dogs in a different colour anyway. A lot of people think that they just provide dogs, but actually they don't. They train rehabilitation officers for people with visual impairment. Um, and they, um, they, they do an awful lot of work. They pay for training. They send, I think, about... 10 people every year to go and train as a visual impairment um, support worker. So, you know, that, that that's quite an important um, aspect of what they do. Um, Noisy Vision is a charity. They, um, they provide reviews on various software and things like that that you can use. Um, Vision Aware, they're another charity. Um, that, that provide advice and guidance for people who are blind. And then we've got the, the ADBS is Accrington and District Blind Society, who I um, who I go to for my um, support um, locally. Um, they're, they're quite a big charity and they help out in, in the East Lancashire area with, with anything connected with sight loss. They've got quite a lot of really good resources. And then Sight Airedale is another, another group that I've used quite extensively. Okay, and so the apps that I mainly use, I've put on the side here, we've got um, Seeing AI, which is the Microsoft um, application that goes on your phone, Be My Eyes, Otter, Dragon Naturally Speaking, and then most importantly, for when I get lost, find friends. And so people who are in my family can track me whenever they, um, wherever they go. Um, 
Has anybody got any questions? Thank you, Dawn. That's been really interesting. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I'm, I'm going to start with one, which is um, you talked about technology that helps you a lot, but what could those of us that create learning content do to make things more accessible? So visual dis visual descriptors. So if you've got if you're producing a PowerPoint presentation like this, um, try and put visual thing. Uh, try and put visual descriptors, which is just a voiceover, really, that when people listen to it, um, not not sort of um, within the presentation afterwards, so that people can can review the slides and go over the the information. Um, if you're going to produce handouts, um, which personally I don't like, but if you are going to produce them and you have to, make sure that you've got a version that's that's in larger print. Um, and the other thing is that don't assume that people who aren't engaging in a workshop that you're doing are being belligerent. It may well be. Ask them, you know, do you need any help? Um, mm. You know, if you've got people coming to your seminars or workshops that you're delivering have it specifically as a question you know as a participant question are you visually impaired you know and and that way you can be prepared for them and you know you can access all of those um all of those websites and they'll give you tons of advice on how to um how to accommodate visually impaired people in in your work okay yeah great thank you um I think that the other question we've got, what would you recommend as a good way for an organisation to make sure all the variety of technology is optimised for individual employee needs? Gosh, that's a good one. Well, I, it depends on the size of the organisation, first of all, but I think every organisation should have somebody that that knows about the settings on, um, on computer equipment. Um, so and and also when you when you buy things um have you checked that it's accessible have you checked what the um what the facilities are for people who are visually impaired you know that is a simple question you know to ask but it's one that often gets overlooked because we all assume everybody can see and um you know, you've got to make sure if you're purchasing something new that you consult with your workforce to find out if there is anybody who is visually impaired. Because um, there are a lot of people who, unlike me, are visually impaired, but frightened to tell their employers. They go through mm. their lives bluffing, you know, um, and not telling people that they're visually impaired because they're worried about the impact on their um, on their employment status. So, um, you know, if, if you know of somebody who is visually impaired, if you see somebody struggling and, and they're there, ask them and, you know, make sure that you know who these people are in your organisation that can optimise um, software. Um, there's also there are also um, people who work for the RNIB who will come and look at your technology or you can go to them and they will give you advice and guidance for free you don't have to pay for it they'll come and do it for you yeah. um so that's that's another thing that you can do and also there are training courses as well that people can go on for visual impairment and if you get an opportunity go on one so that's you know that's that's my advice great thank you um uh Okay, the uh, coming here. Recently attended a BCS IT North, uh, I think that's Northern Nine talk regarding designing for accessibility, which recommended mm -hmm. a web website accessibility simulator Chrome extension called Silk Tide. Silk Tide. I've not come across that one, but Silk I will look it up. Tide. Yeah, so, I've I've not come so. across I've not come across that, um, but I'm sure that, that that there are, you know, some some good accessibility tools yeah. out there that will help you. But I've I can't really comment on that because I've not seen it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, how widely are Braille computers and I/O devices used? 
to meet the IT needs for severely sight impaired people. So it's actually quite difficult to get hold of Braille equipment because it's very expensive. Um, mm. We have in in the northwest we have one person that I know of in Clitheroe who um, who is running Braille courses and teaching people how to use uh, Braille, um, and that's that's kind of like the next stage of my journey. Um, you know, I've got to find out how to use those things. In terms of how widely they are used, I couldn't I couldn't really tell you. And I know that they're not very widely used. Um, quite a lot of the visually impaired people that I see on a regular basis can't use Braille. Um, it's very difficult to learn. That's one thing. And also it's beyond the um, affordability of quite a lot of blind people to to actually purchase a, a braille printer you know to, to actually use one so they're not as extensively used as you know um, I couldn't give you a figure but I, I know they're not as extensively used in the blind community as perhaps people would think yeah uh, it, it was interesting that you've, you've not mentioned it Yes. Where I think the questions probably come from, but um, uh, there's just a comment on the silk tide. It's on how it's a plugin that helps you un understand as a non visually impaired person how your website would appear to somebody with visual impairment. I shall so, have to have a look at that. Yes. So we'll have to that, have a look. That, that sounds very interesting. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else uh, got any questions? I think that no, that's all the questions we've got. I know we've got a, we've got a few minutes over, but that was really interesting, Dawn. Thank you for putting this together. Um, You're very I've welcome. learned a lot from this, and um, I hope it's going to be a useful resource for the BCS community in general, because uh, it'll be up on the our YouTube channel. But uh, it, it's it's good to have resources that we can go to to help us from all perspectives. And I, I think you've given us a really interesting perspective, sort of as somebody that's come from the technology world that has gone through visual impairment um, and what that's like and what we can do to help and uh, support and the technology that, that you use, which is great. So okay, thank, thank you. you for that. It's been a really, really interesting evening. And um, just say to everyone, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, I hope you can join us for next month's talk. And uh, if you do want to listen to this again, then uh, it'll be up on the YouTube site. So I just say thank you very much, Dawn, and uh, good evening, and look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you. Thank you.